we'd like to thank you for joining us for our first of the weekly LDA webinar series this month. We're very, very, very excited to launch our Learning Disability Awareness Month efforts through this webinar. And we thought it best to start with an overview of terminology because caregivers and educators alike, rightfully so, face confusion when they're presented with all of this information, all the terminology that surrounds learning disabilities. And so we have two expert panelists who are going to walk us through what some of these terms mean. So thank you. Thank you for joining us again. This will be recorded and shared with you afterwards. Um, so not a worry there and feel free as we're moving through the agenda and and the main event to drop your questions in the chat. So or the Q&A so that we can make sure that we're answering those questions live. If we don't have time, time doesn't permit at the end, then we will absolutely circle back with you and make sure that all your needs are met. So first, we're going to start with introductions, of course. Then I will give just a brief overview of Learnfully, our mission and our services. Then we'll jump into LD Awareness Month and our efforts there. We'll have the expert panel. We'll talk through our offerings. And then if there's time again for Q&A, we will absolutely open it up. So I am Jess Corinne. I am the head of educational services for Learnfully. I started my career as a K-1 classroom teacher, super excited to dive into the classroom and apply everything that I had learned in life. Quickly, I realized that I was ill-equipped to serve each and every one of the neurodivergent learners in the classroom. And so I moved back home and joined forces with Linda Mood Bell Learning Processes, where I truly believe that I refined the art of multisensory evidence-based implementation. I worked with students in the Learning Center as well as in our school services division. So I had an opportunity to experience the global impact of supporting schools and partnering with professionals and other communities. And then I moved back home and opened my own private practice, spread my wings, got a lot more training in Orton Gillingham, Wilson Reading System, step up to writing, social thinking, you name it. I wanted to truly say that I was able to personalize and differentiate my efforts, not just for our learner community, but also for the schools and the professionals who I partnered with. And that's what brought me to Learnfully. Here I oversee the instructional fidelity, administration of our assessments, and the educational specialist network as a whole. And um, I am so, so fortunate to have Dr. Yajnik with us as one of our collaborative partners. I'd love for you to kick off the introduction. Thank you. So hi, I'm Dr. Misha Yajnik. I'm a board certified pediatrician. I have been a pediatrician for about 10 years in the outpatient setting. Um, in addition to being doing what normal pediatricians do as far as physical health, growth, and development. I'm very passionate about supporting families, children um, with emotional health, mental health, um, neurodivergence. So this has been really great to work with the Learnfully team to support these families. Just aside from what your support you get in the classroom, you often turn to your pediatrician for a lot of these questions, a lot of frustrating things um, that might come up. And I just, I'm very fortunate to be a part of that support system. So I'm glad to be here today. Yay, thank you. And then my right-hand gal, we have Director of Educational Support, Taya Slingland here. Okay, so I, yes, I'm the Director of Educational uh, Services over here at Learnfully. I actually started also, interesting enough, in a K-1 classroom <laughs> a few years ago. And in, in general ed, I taught there up until I met that one student that changed the trajectory of my career. Um, it was a student in the process of getting diagnosed. It ended up being diagnosed with autism. And there were some behaviors that were emerged that I just felt like the child was telling me something. So I wanted to know, hmm. is she telling me? So I went back and got a um, education specialist credential um, for um, just basically for that learner <laughs> and to mm. from the general ed classroom to become a resource specialist in uh, the state of California and went on to get my master's degree. And, you know, through that process, um, I met Jess. I was the director of learning support for a very large private school in the Southern California area. And I just really got into the notion of providing services online, which I just find it's it works for some of our learners where we have some of that um, sensory issues with being in that the loud and boisterous environments of the classroom that we can provide um, that nurturing for and 
away the races we go. Yes, we are so fortunate to have you both on our team. So let's dive in. We always start with why and our why is our mission and our values. And so through these values, growth, possibilities, community, partnership, and connections, our mission is to ensure that every child, although they learn differently, has the opportunity to learn fully. They deserve and need the personalization in order for them to not just to reach, but really fully realize their learning potential and their full potential as a whole. Learnfully is comprised of a personalized platform of highly qualified and curated educational specialists who have a diversity of training, credentials, personality to match to really engage our learners and expedite progress as a whole. Our network is composed of a multiplicity of programs. We are agnostic to programs intentionally because, again, we want to make sure that we're individualizing our implementation, our recommendations, our caregiver and learner support based on what we truly feel they need, regardless of what program um, that, may, that may entail. So we ensure that our caregivers and that ecosystem of support, the educators, the professionals to surround our learners and, and nurture and foster them to the best of their ability, also have all the resources and feel equipped to maintain that momentum and expedite progress in between sessions through a robust content library, through coaches and specialists, educational therapists, executive functioning coaches, and beyond. We also really pride ourselves on proactive communication to ensure that everybody on the learner's team knows exactly where they stand in terms of progress and goals. And so we have a, a well-oiled feedback loop, if you will, where they receive weekly session notes and monthly progress update forms to ensure they have that conversation, ongoing conversation, and that we are being extremely transparent all along the way. So why Learning Disability Awareness Month, right? Oops, sorry. Um, so Learning Disability Awareness Month is very important to us. We see learners with or without a diagnosis. So I'm gonna make that super clear. We have found that this number that learners who are diagnosed with a disability run about one in five or 20%. But in reality, we feel strongly that it's much higher than that, that some learners don't have access to assessments in order to qualify for a diagnosis. Um, maybe they have a lack of awareness at home or in their school community in terms of what they need. And then we have those learners who are on the cusp, who may struggle, face challenges, but they're not falling far enough behind in order to qualify or warrant a diagnosis. That doesn't necessarily they're not, mean that they're not struggling. So it is important to us to be able to shed light on these different tiers, these different layers of learning differences, um, so that we can look at the learner as a whole and really treat the learner in the way that they need and deserve. So these learning disabilities that are celebrated in October, there's five of them. There are ADHD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, and dyspraxia. That's also known as developmental coordination disorder. And so we really are on a mission to spread awareness about those disabilities and also learners who face challenges as a whole. We're going to break down this terminology with our panelists today, but I wanted to create a visual that made it super clear as to where we stand. We see the learner at the center of our model. Neurodiversity is a combination of these variables. It's an integration of all these layers of differences that our learners may or may not experience. And so some, again, might, may warrant a disability, and we'll talk further to that. Some may face a dysfunction of some sort, a disorder. We're all learning differently. So this beautiful Venn diagram that shows that integration really shows the learner, the neurodivergent learner or the learner who learns differently, which is just about right, everybody, is at the center of our model and is a part of the integration of these variables that impact their ability not only to learn inside the classroom, but to learn wholeheartedly, holistically outside of the classroom. Let's do it, expert panelists. Okay, so we're going to kick it off with Dr. Misha, and she's going to explain to us what a learning disability is. Great. Thank you, Jess. So I love that Venn diagram because I think it's very accurate and kind of showing the overlap. So um, that's definitely something that's really very relevant here with all this terminology is that there's a lot of overlap. Um, so just knowing that the term, you know, when we use the word learning disability, it's more of a legal technical term, um, oftentimes coming from the education system or the school or someone that's kind of doing that initial assessment. Um, so, you know, knowing that one in five learners can be diagnosed, does have a diagnosis of a learning disability, but as Jess said, not everybody is diagnosed. Um, and it is more of a permanent kind of disorder 
um, that affects a lot of these individuals, but knowing that they often have average, you know, above average normal um, intelligence. Um, so knowing kind of different examples of what falls under, under this, um, this kind of title of disability. So like um, Jess mentioned, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, dyspraxia, um, and ADHD. So just kind of getting into more specifics of, you know, disorders with math or writing or reading. It's a permanent disability, right? It's usually used to qualify learners who need services in the school system, most likely the public school system, just to reiterate what you said. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Okay, um, so go ahead. Yeah, and this kind of overlaps with, you know, kind of what I see more of is, is the diagnosis of learning disorder. So this okay. kind of goes into more of the medical terminology of, um, you know, the, the official diagnosis, which we use a certain type of criteria known as the DSM, which stands for the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. Um, of mental disorders. So this is something that all physicians, general pediatricians, psychiatrists um, are, you know, kind of educated with these kind of diagnoses and there's certain criteria that we look for um, to qualify a child with this diagnosis of using the word disorder. Um, and again, there can be overlap with disability. I just want to make that clear, but this is typically something that I will discuss with the family that I believe they fit these criteria and hence learning disorder is what we're, um, is what we're calling it. Um, and there's lots of different causes. So, you know, there, it can be genetic, it can be related to physical trauma, psychological trauma, um, kind of some diseases um, in the prenatal phase. So there's lots of different reasons that then we would as physicians dig deeper to kind of understand um, the background of, of why, why we're dealing with this. Um, it can be a learning disorder in different areas, you know, um, and so that's something that's very, very important. Again, kind of some of the labels and what we're doing is trying to figure out what areas are we, do we need to provide support for? Um, and then the, you know, the different types of difficulties that we're dealing with could be academic, it could be, um, you know, with normal or uh, above average intelligence, it could be um, the different kind of categories that we mentioned earlier too, with, you know, reading, writing, math, that kind of stuff. Um, what's important here to, is to kind of see that when we're dealing with the medical diagnosis, that then in turn can help with some of the legal help that you can get through the school system, through the, um, the, the Individuals and Disability Education Act, um, and that's where that overlap comes in. So yeah, you might come see me and talk to me about getting a diagnosis, and then the next step is, okay, what are we doing with that diagnosis, um, and how are we getting your child some help? I love that. And just to be clear on the, the disorder, I was listening to a podcast the other day and they made it very clear that in order for you to qualify, qualify for a disorder, you may, you have to really impact your life, right? You have to be suffering. It has to cause pain. And, and a lot of these differences do, but we have to look at it as a spectrum. Yes. Right? And that's, that's swinging all the way to the side. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So you have it, you have a learning disability and, and honestly, the learning disabilities that we're celebrating during learning disability month, there are many more than the five that we're celebrating this month. So to be clear, I did type that answer in the chat. There are other learning disabilities that are, do not necessarily fall under this month of celebration that we celebrate all year long, just like the other ones, like a, a specific learning dis disability in math, writing, reading, there's expressive language disorder. I mean, there's other types that we can go for fully into depth about, but this month is about those five disabilities that we named earlier. Okay. I just have to reverbalize for myself, audience, <laughs> to make sure we are all clear. Okay, so then what's a learning dysfunction? Taya's is going to walk us through the next two. What is a dysfunction, especially as it's compared to a disability and a disorder? Okay, so one of the things that I, and I just to kind of dovetail on what just, just said and also uh, what Dr. Yannick said is that from an education standpoint, when we talk about impact, um, you can say, oh my, yes, my child has dyslexia and, you know, that's a, that is a disorder that's close to my heart, runs in my family, um, actually did a lot of study on that, but it, it has to impact your way in, in your child in such a way that they are significantly behind. So if your child is reading, is in fourth grade, it's reading at fourth grade level and it's a little choppy and maybe they're not getting a hundred percent, but they're exceptionally bright because our dyslexics typically are, um, you have 
you know, that's not enough to qualify for the IEP. So I don't want to set you up and think, oh, I got my dyslexia diagnosis. We're, now we're going to go get our IEP because my child's not reading necessarily. We're talking, you know, years behind. That's is a great point. The IEP. And I and need I that as a parent to remember that too, because I'm constantly sitting across the homework table and one of my children in particular is struggling with accessing the content at grade level, but he's, he's almost there. And so I'm constantly reminding myself, okay, that doesn't mean that he's two to three years behind, which is what Taya is saying would qualify possibly for a diagnosis and then the support through the school system. It is. And, and, and that's not, it, you know, and I, it, I'm coming at this from a parent and educator, um, make sure that, it, you know, just because the school system says that, you know, your child's not behind enough to qualify for their assistance, doesn't mean you're, what your mommy heart is telling you that they're struggling they're struggling. Let's face it. We know our babies. We know this. And so, you know, that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, provide other services or, or interventions or assistance in manner. It's just not necessarily going to be qualified under the IEP system. Um, so with further ado, uh, going into dysfunction. Now, dysfunction is used to describe one's lack of executive function abilities, which like I had mentioned, could be temporary be permanent but it's a lot of what we do over here and learn play because what executive function does is that every day everything everything we do goes through executive function it's simply put it is the skills manager that takes the knowledge that you've acquired and tells it when and how to activate so it i can have a child that's reading long text and you're going, wait a minute, you know that word. You've read that word a million times. And they read it incorrectly. You point it to them, they read it correctly. That's not a skills-based deficit. That is an executive function deficit. because They're not self-monitoring. So that's one of the things that when you, you, you have that, that child that's gone through this expensive intervention and they, did, they test it out. They're, they're, here they are in the classroom, but they're not independent yet. Why? Because we need to make sure we're attacking the executive function, the manager of all those skills. So, and one of the things is, is it is this, this compensation through strategies that will actually mitigate other areas such as IQ or even processing issues. We wanna make sure we're using that knowledge to the best of our ability. And by building that process of self-awareness, we can assist the student in establishing that self-monitoring behavior by encouraging a set of inner criteria. So we're literally showing them, when you see this, do this, do this, do this, um, for that specific skill, and then makes them independent because ultimately mm -hmm. intervention doesn't, is goal should be independence. It's not to always produce intervention. It's to, we don't succeed until you leave us. Yeah, our job is to work ourselves out of a job. Our, jo <laughs> our job is to, you know, to, sing your praises and, you know, send you on your way toward, toward the wonderful person that you are. So, so thank you though, Taya, for noting that this may not be permanent because the last two, just correct me and keep me honest, Dr. Misha, the last two are permanent, but a dysfunction is not necessarily permanent because neuroplasticity or the rewiring of one's brain can actually support a student in executive functioning. It can support the other areas too, but it doesn't necessarily then take away the criterion of the diagnosis of the disorder. With mm -hmm. executive dysfunction, you can learn strategies, you can rewire the prefrontal cortex. It isn't even fully developed until mid twenties or older. And so mm -hmm. you can kind of establish these systems and structures to, to shift your, yourself out of a dysfunction into a function. Versus, versus identified. Yeah, dysfunction. great exactly. point, Taya, yeah, thank you. And then, okay. Then what's the difference? We have all these other definitions. What is a learning difference in this context? Okay, so, you know, it is in, it's important for us to understand that, you know, I always, I always look at the one in five and I always say, you know, we're all different. <laughs> if we were really be honest, if you lined us all up, all of us would have a unique ability. And I, instead of always going, you know, yes, the disability helps us guide in what interventions to be prescriptive and to get, you know, those comp create those compensatory strategies to use the best of what you have. But we also want to celebrate the ability because there's always that ability in, in each profile. So every, 
Keeping that in mind, every learner is unique in their own right and bringing with them varying interests and experiences that make them special. I had a child that could just instantly uh, could take a story and create this visual that in ways I just, my brain just couldn't even do. They're artistic. I mean, that was an ability. Now, when she went to write it, it was a little bit more challenging. So, but it's, you know, one didn't negate the other. It's just using that ability to help launch her area that she had difficulty with. She created a visual and then she was able to write because that she mentally mapped it. And so building on those strengths to empower their neurodiversity is, is that con contribution rather than a diversion from learning. Um, the, now, I always like to say the difference between tutoring, because a lot of people come and they'll say, okay, you're just a tutoring company. The difference between tutoring and a specialist is this notion of, okay, what is the whole picture? I'm not just looking at, okay, you're having trouble reading. I'm going to do this same, same program for every child who has, who has difficulty reading. We want to disseminate everything about that learner, take it apart. And then we want to put together, okay, how are they coming to us? Is there executive function deficit? It's rooted, you know, the specialist is rooted in the executive function process since it is important for us to understand the deficits in learning are actually either a skill or a function. So now if it's a skill, like I said, we would go apply prescriptive intervention that shows the student how to perform a task. That's more tutoring. But if it's a function issue, we need to teach environmental cues specific to that task specific to that, where that learner's unique presentation is, that will then show them which function to pull up, which one that they wanna do. So it, you see that it's that knowing this difference and how to apply and execute this level of intervention cohesively is a precursor for successful retention. And that's what we want. So without it, and you have a student that can perform well in a clinical setting, as I had mentioned, but they go home or they go to the classroom and the independence is like, wait a minute, they passed all this stuff. How come they can't do it? It's not that they can't, they can't access it. So we need to make sure we're bringing that up together, just like we bring reading and writing up together. Perfect. I absolutely agree. That was brilliantly put. It's the idea. I mean, there's a reason why differentiation has the word difference in it, right? It's all about the implementation, meeting the learner's needs and meeting them where they're at based on their learner profile, their learning abilities at that point in time. And so we're all about diversity. We love the differences. This is why, why you know, humans are exist is to really embrace the differences amongst us. And so it's our job as specialists to really pinpoint what those differences are and how we can treat them in the most holistic, um, you know, less intrusive way. So thank you, Taya. That was so well put. I just get so fired up over it. <laughs> so forgive me. You ladies are awesome. Thank you. So how can you get involved? So LDA is all month, but let's be honest, it's 365 days a year. So how do you get involved, right? And so we have a delineation of resources and organizations to follow that you can do some research, dig into, see if there's events in your area. We have a whole Learning Disability Awareness Month toolkit that you can find on our front homepage website. And when you click on that, th these are there too, but we also have other events and resources that you can access through that toolkit. So we will make sure we send a link to the toolkit in our follow-up email with this recording. But just in case you're taking notes or you'd like to screenshot, feel free. Um, the IDA is definitely top of our list in addition to a few others, but the IDA has different, I, I wanna say they have different branches. So look in your specific area because they have events specific to your community, to your city. Children's and, children and adults with ADHD, ADD is CHAD, and they don't have as many local chapters. So that might be something a little more national. LDAA, understood.org, ADDA, and of course, Learnfully are all here to support you. Um, so feel free to, again, do your research, dig in, reach out if you have any questions about that and look out for our LDA toolkit because it's it's a robust inventory of resources and events, um, not only for this month, but to celebrate differences all year long. Well, thank you, everybody. We do offer, as we said, educational therapy and executive functioning coaching. We had start with an assessment to really pinpoint where that breakdown is happening. If you have an assessment in hand, we can skip straight to sessions. We'll do a file review or records review. We'll get a report from someone like Dr. Misha or for an IEP of any sort. And we can take that information and make recommendations for a plan. 
If you have questions about our assessment process or our services as a whole, feel free to reach out, email us, call us, text us. Um, you can go to our website and, and fill out if, any kind of form to really support your needs. But we wanted to make sure that you had this overview before we dive into some more detailed webinars later this month. So next week, we're going to be talking about the value of an assessment and a learning profile. The following week will be the DISs, so the dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, and dyspraxia. And then the last week, we're going to talk about ADHD and executive dysfunction, the similarities and differences. So join us, if you will, if you may. And then if you can't, feel free to still register because we'll send you the recording and the resources thereafter. Let me check and make sure we don't have any questions before I sign off. I think I, I did an okay job answering them live, but sometimes that's tricky for me. Okay, great. I think we're good to go. If you have any other questions, again, just reach out, but we're so grateful for you joining us today. Thanks for being here. Thanks, panelists. We appreciate you.